We've talked a lot about platforms at Commit, and one of the consistent themes has been simplicity, with fewer integrations to maintain and more visibility across the lifecycle because you have a single source of truth. We can bring more people into the process and we can extend their reach so they can become more productive and do more things. And that's great. When you pair simplicity with scope, it's very, very powerful. But with that power comes the ability to introduce new complications into the system. One area where that can happen very easily is cloud native workloads. It's very, very easy to overcomplicate things, especially if you ignore simplicity and manageability and you focus exclusively on scaling. So our next speaker, Robbie Lockman, will go into a lot more detail about some of the traps you might encounter on your Kubernetes journey and provide some tips on keeping things simple enough to help you maintain the productivity, which is the whole reason you're trying to do this in the first place. Let's listen. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome back to another GitHub Commit. I'm super excited that you're here to hear my talk and couldn't be happier to chat with you during the talk. So my talk is called Scaling Simplicity, Idea to Production in Kubernetes. And we're going to be going through a little bit of a journey that we had here at Harness when we're actually we're migrating to Kubernetes. So a little bit about me. I'm Robbie Lockman. I'm an evangelist at Harness. You can get me at my GitLab handle at Robbie Lock. Also, my Twitter handle at Robbie Lock if you want to communicate afterwards. So what are we going to be talking about today? So let's actually talk about a time before Kubernetes. Yes, there was a time before Kubernetes and workloads were distributed long before that. And also, as you're going through your own Kubernetes journey, simplicity has its virtues. One of the design principles, KISS, keep it simple, stupid, is very important. And we get into that. And during your journey, scale will come, right? So don't worry if you're not using the latest and greatest, which is kind of hard to say in Kubernetes, as Kubernetes is kind of mainstream now. If you're not using the bleeding edge, that's okay. And then also we're going to be talking about continuous delivery, which is your conduit from idea to production. And so a time before K8. So let's take a look at actually a distributed system architecture uh, right before Kubernetes. This is actually this is the architecture that I was most familiar with before Kubernetes. Now in my background, I've been a JE or J Java Enterprise Edition software engineer for a long time. I had lots of workloads off of Kubernetes and lots of workloads on Kubernetes. And so going through this particular distributed architecture, uh, there might looking from the user to, let's say, some area that you have some sort of persistence is that, you know what, the first thing is you get load balanced. And then you might have more than one application server, right? So the time right before Kubernetes, it was normal to have, let's say, one application per application container. And even having, if you had a stateful application, those application servers had to communicate. So you're looking at some sort of in-application clustering or out-of-application out clustering. For example, if in the Java stack, you might be using a particular in-memory cache like Infinispan, or even clustering or consensus algorithms and platforms such as JGroups. And then finally, you know, you don't live in outer space or in the ether. At some point, you'll have to write something at some point. So if the database stack might be some sort of streaming messaging like Hadoop or writing to a file-level database like Cassandra or even you know, our good old friend Postgres here. And potentially uh, before Kubernetes, um, there was a big investment into platform as a service or passes. So you might be using a Cloud Foundry rendition, rendition. let that be a Pivotal Cloud Foundry, IBM Bluemix, or even open source Cloud Foundry itself, or even you're looking at something like Mesos for DC West. So there, there was help to get this architecture out there and to also facilitate each one of these moving parts. Uh, but like any distributed system, if you take a look at this distributed system, there's this thing called the fallacies of distributed computing, right? So it was, it was developed by uh, some engineers at Sun Microsystems that no matter if you have a distributed a platform or distributed computing is that, hey, you know what? These things are actually fallacies. First of all, your bandwidth is not infinite, right? You have caps of bandwidth. A big one here is latency. Uh, no matter how many Kubernetes clusters or how many nodes you have, uh, there's still going to be latency between the distributed system, right? Or between the nodes or even you know, looking at modern Clark architecture, if you have different availability zones, there's going to be latency between the AZs. And also, again, a distributed system is not 100% reliable. You know, the more parts you have, potentially, the more failures you have. The, the old adage, you know, do you want a plane with four engines or a plane with two engines? Well, you know, the more parts you have, the more failure there is. And also, and this is actually very true Kubernetes, the assumption that there's going to be one and only one admin is not true, right? Like the beauty of Kubernetes is that 
the more people you have kubectl Cube access to, which is you know, if you're familiar with, it's command line or Kubernetes, uh, you have the ability to change the cluster. Uh, but what do you get? So here's that, you know, I'm not going to, you know, kind of, you know, kind of rain on Kubernetes too much. Again, like Kubernetes didn't automatically solve these problems, right? Like you still have latency. If you have your nodes that are too distributed, uh, they actually might get more marked as unhealthy if the latency is too high, right? If Kubernetes, uh, their KubeADM can't connect or, or can, uh, talk to the different nodes. Uh, reliability, like any system, you know what? It's not, you're not automatically reliable. Um, the platform itself, you know, needs management. Um, your workloads are not automatically more reliable because you're in Kubernetes. Again, you know, the same network I.O. that you're bound with without Kubernetes, uh, it hasn't increased unless your network I.O. is increased. And again, going back to one admin, actually, there's, you know, it's designed to have multiple admins, right? So you might have some sort of tasks that are overwritten uh, and just having to make sure you keep those people in line. But what do you get with Kubernetes, right? So what do you get? Well, Kubernetes is really, really good with, with lots of things, right? So you get... For example, you get parity, right? So if you're, if you're having something running in your local machine, uh, something in your local machine like you know K3 is your Minikube, you know, there's some expectation that that workload is going to run kind of similar in a production uh, cluster. Uh, you get scale, right? So adding more pods, uh, more replicas, and even actually more worker nodes is trivial, right? Like you can you can scale your cluster to support the workloads or workload of your choice. Uh, upgrades, right? So if you look at what it took to orchestrate a container workload without an orchestrator, um, basically if you had just some sort of patch or upgrade, uh, which means in the container world, it's immutable, so you're making a new version of the image. Um, it's actually pretty easy to do that with Kubernetes, right? You can say, hey, you know what, redeploy this version and Kubernetes will start taking care of that for you. And also with all of these benefits, you get more agility, right? Potentially that if your operations team, your, your development team, your application infrastructure team, of all three of those teams are speaking kind of the same language here at Kubernetes, uh, you get harmony and agility with that. So let's talk about the, I call it the virtues or virtuous simplicity, right? And so uh, let's talk about why simplicity is, is so important, especially with the distributed system. So uh, taking a look at your particular firm, uh, there is, do you have an internal versus external customer, right? So it, let's talk, take this in the, in the terms of being a platform engineer. Um, so your internal customers could be your development teams, right? And the thing is with internal customers, they don't have any choices. What you give them is what they, what they get, right? Now, there's a whole notion of shadow IT, uh, but for the most part, you know what? They're, they're not going to be rocking the boat. You know, it's they don't have a choice versus your external customers or quote unquote your actual customers of the business uh they have almost infinite choice right they have lots and lots and lots of choice uh, and so you know, the adage that your external customers don't care how you did something is actually pretty true they care about the results right versus your internal customers absolutely care how you do something because they're subject to it right so if your internal if external customers are happy or vice versa. If your internal customers are happy, they produce the best work for your external customers. This can be a very intrinsic talk, but really, you know what? You, you have to support both customers, right? At, at the same time, uh, because again, your external customers, you know what? If you have something overly complicated, they don't care. And it's detrimental to your internal customers. Uh, because why is this? Well, eventually in times that are good and in times that are bad, uh, we move on, right? So as people, we're, we're very rarely, or I would say almost never at, at the same company for 30 years anymore. We're not, especially we're not the same project for 30 years. Uh, and all of the institutional knowledge that we have kind of goes, you know, when times are good, get a new job. When times are bad, yeah, you might get a new job, <laughs> right? Or change project teams and, or change tribes or uh, depending if you're on that uh, Spotify model. Uh, but that's it, right? Eventually people move on, move up, you know, and, and next, the next generation comes in and gives a fresh pair of eyes to the problems. And if you have something that's overly complex, like you're limiting the number of people who have knowledge, A, the, the learning curve would be extremely high when they join the team, and B, a lot of what industry convention uh, might be kind of weaning uh, on your particular team. And the la you know, one of the last things that you don't want to be doing, and this would be a guiding principle if you're an architect, is that you don't want to be troubleshooting the, at the bleeding edge, right? And so here's that little famous meme, you know, there's, <laughs> hey, you know what, I only test in production, or you like to watch the world burn. Um, it, it's... Items that are tried and true, uh, yeah, th there's kind of two parts there. One, there's operational maturity. So the kind of the, old, the more mature something is, there's more operational maturity. And so that if there is a problem, there's more of a prescription of what to do at the bleeding edge, which is the first time 
you know, if you're using something in alpha or beta, there's not much, you know, use of scale, maybe one or two Silicon Valley firms have invented it. And they're kind of, you know, they're, they're operating at scale, but they have 40 people using it versus there's like two people <laughs> at your firm who, you know, who might have a little bit of, uh, you know, exposure on D zone or something to something like this. You don't want to be troubleshooting the bleeding edge. Like when all eyes are on you or all eyes are on the team, the last thing you want to do, right? You might run the edge cases that you just haven't, or raise conditions that you just haven't thought about before. And that's it. You, you know, you don't want to be troubleshooting on the bleeding edge. Uh, let's talk about scale will come. So eventually, yes, you know what? You start to incorporate new, especially in our journey, we start to incorporate new technology uh, in buckets of it, right? And so, and, and depending on the functionality that we need, but scale will come. So the first thing you want to try to do is when you're kind of building out your journey, uh, is that actually focusing in on, well, you know, wh why are you migrating? And also, well, this particular trifecta, that if you've seen any sort of the DevOps monikers, people, process, technology, uh, this is it, right? Like this is the DevOps mantra. But uh, I, I kind of point a little bit different of a picture here is that I call it the confidence trifecta and asking the question, where do you have the least confidence is where you're going to start building first, right? So the, I always like to say computers are easy, but people are hard. And so if, if technology, if you're the least confident in your, let's say, infrastructure technology, that's easy to solve for. For example, you know what? Uh, for some odd reason, we're, you know, we're having maintenance trouble in our application. We don't want like bringing it down. And so, okay, why don't we have five nodes of the application then? Because in the things of five, you can take two concurrent failures, right? You can do a... You can do one for maintenance or upgrade and one for actual failure. And that's actually very you know, confident in you know, having five nodes of a particular uh, resource or service. Uh, Process-wise, okay, sure. You know what? We, so we, you know, we don't have proper test coverage. And so we need someone with a lot of domain experience uh, to review the changes, or especially if you're in a highly regulated industry or things that take a lot of domain experience, like insurance uh, or healthcare, like this you know, might take, or banking especially, um, it might take someone to kind of, you know, who, know, who knows the, the domain, uh, solve for that. We could put that person in the process or people in the process versus people. If you're the least confident in your people, it's, it's guardrail city, right? You're building all sorts of guardrails in between that. But even, even more so, you know, people are naturally curious, right? Especially software engineers. They want to try new stuff out. They want to build things. And this huge push into cloud native architecture is these two terms that are actually going against each other. So let me, let me start the basis with this. Adipidency plus infinity equals cloud native. And so, so if something is indipotent, it's actually a mathematical construct that it's uh, no matter how many times you hit uh, the same equation, you get the same result, right? So, or a good example is asking the weather. So I live in Alpharetta, Georgia. Outside, it's kind of sunny and humid today. Uh, so if I go, you know, ask, hey, what is the weather in Alpharetta? It's sunny and humid. No matter how many times versus the weather changes, I ask that question, I get the same answer from each piece of the distributed system. Versus um, a familiarity is that being ephemeral means you're short lived, right? So containerized workloads meant to die. If you have something that's super long running, it might not be, you know, wise to put it in a, in a single container. Uh, but if you have on one hand something that needs to be consistent and something on the other hand that will die all the time, those two things are actually competing against each other. And you would think to yourself that, hmm, you know what? There's probably like three things on earth that can actually do this which is actually incorrect. So if you take a look at the choice overload, uh, which is the this, the common thing of pundits here, this Cloud Native Compute Foundation, CNCF landscape, there's, that, you know, there's over a thousand cards or 1500 cards here, is that there's so much choice and so much, I would say, very granular functionality and things that are vying for incremental improvements and very granular functionality. Uh, it, it's you get inundated with, with choice, right? So how can you decipher if something is bleeding edge versus mature? You know, do you have to be using like several or dozens or all, not all of these technologies at one time for it to be to be confident in this? No, you know, you need to start your journey somewhere and build that operational uh, expertise and operational excellence. And, and change will come, right? So let's take let's actually take a look at you know our, our journey. Our journey has been going on for two years now. Uh, when we've been migrating um, our workloads, uh, to, purely to Kubernetes. And so kind of like the first you know, day zero, I will call it, when we start turning on workloads, we're using very vanilla instances of GKE, right? So our, our cloud provider, uh, in this case is Google. Uh, and so we were using, we were trying to stay as 
you know, out of the box as possible without writing tons of custom resources and operators and whatnot and say, hey, you know what, if this functionality is given to us by default or something easily injectable by Google, um, let's go ahead and take that. And change will come, right? Like, hey, you don't have to do it all at one time. You know, if you, you know, kind of the shiny penny, you know, a year ago might have been a service mesh like Istio, or even more kind of running out last year. You might be hearing something at a company called OPA or Open Policy Agent. Uh, you know, we're leveraging those things now, but it, we weren't leveraging them, you know, two years ago, right? Like, hey, you know, we weren't really invested that much in the service mesh years ago. Um, OPA is one of a newer, kind of a newer uh, type of way of doing something. And uh, we haven't been invested in that early on. And again, understanding that, hey, you know, change will come. Because if you try to do too much change at one time, uh, there's this concept of shifting left, right? So you might have heard several talks here talking about shifting left, shifting left, shifting left. And, and this actually introduces complexity. You know, so computer science is like an abacus. You, you, complexity never goes away. Right, you're just moving complexity around. You know, anybody with experience will tell you that. Like, hey, you're just moving it from left to right, or you know, in the abacus. And you know, the more we shift left, the more the more that the control and the prescription, the domain expertise outside the DevOps or platform management team gets shifted to the developer. Right. So uh, not only when a developer, you know, if you take too much of shift to left, hey, not only does the developer have to write the feature. Uh, they're also shipping route changes with Istio, right? And they're also saying, you know what, we need the op because of using OPA, the author can also be the enforcer of the system. And so, it, you know, we, when when a design consideration that you know, we had to take into consideration here is that as we shifted you know, more items, like, hey, you know, what what is the role of the platform engineering team? What is the role of you know, do we make sure that the Istio service is up and people can make changes versus do we have another expert like a, a network infrastructure engineer take a look at this versus do we have an AppSec engineer take a look at some of the OPA changes? Like, wh where is that balance, right? Do we put all that, that emphasis on the developer, which can be fairly difficult? Uh, because, again, you know, th that there's just two technologies. It's what will the future hold, right? As my father, you know, where we are today versus in two years from now, um, as my father would say, you know, if I could predict the future, let me go buy a lottery ticket. And, I, <laughs> you know, I would, I would just buy a couple lottery tickets and be set for life, right? But unfortunately, you know, we can't, we can't predict the future. But uh, taking a look at, uh, you know, some other things that are coming on the line, uh, leveraging something like a, a Berkeley packet filter here, like EPPF, uh, you know, that, that could be something that we're looking into. Now, there, there are dangers of this. Um, uh, the, at the current time we're recording the talk, uh, there has been a very uh, kind of big, Linux kernel EPPF or um, a particular uh, CVE that came out, right? So it's, it's some sort of incorrect balance calculation. You know, I'm, I'm not a kernel engineer. I couldn't tell you what that means. But because that's out there, you know, it, it, it's coming back to how do we keep complexity in check, right? Like, hey, you know what? Going back to, hey, I'm not a kernel engineer. You know, I'm a software engineer or a platform engineer. That, that low level <laughs> CVE shows that, hey, as we continue to push more complexity, people with the expertise or people who would have, you know, hey, you know what? So we had a rel engineer who managed, you know, the, the or large distributions. Those are, you know, kind of rare, rarity these days. Uh, wh where, where do we have the person with the expertise or people with expertise, right? As you keep pushing more and more complexity, um, it, it's, you know what? I'm not a kernel, like going back to not a kernel engineer. I also am not a network engineer. So Istio was a new one to me, <laughs> right? Networking roles. And, you know what, not only that they have to author multiple things, but they have n number of custom resource definitions that are going into you know the deployment at this point. And it, it just keeps going on and on. So like be be wary of that, right? Like Kubernetes is at the sawwall. Now let's talk about okay, let's be a little positive now. Let's actually talk about getting getting your idea uh, into production, right? And like kind of why you know some of those caveats there that were important to, to understand as you're kind of marching towards production. Uh, and so the first thing is I call this a talk and a talk. Um, I participate in this organization called the Continuous Delivery Foundation, or CDF. So I, this is a, a problem space I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I actually gave a talk called, How Much Should You Deploy? Right? Well, how much should you deploy? This is an open-ended question here. Uh, you know, you, let's say you're curious for the first time, you grab your copy of the Lean Enterprise, and you Google it, you know, and you say, oh, well, Amazon deploys every 11 seconds. I'm, I'm pretty sure this number is less than this now. You might say, okay, you know what? We're not deploying every 10 seconds. We're, you know, we're doing no good. Well, hold on. You know what? The argument is that everybody's Amazon. And we'll actually take a, you know, kind of unpack what your deployments used to look like uh, before Kubernetes, right? So who are, going back to who remembers these deployments, right? And so deploying uh, prior to Kubernetes or a, let's say or a mature Kubernetes instance is that, you know what? 
you might be using a platform as a service, right? You might, in this case, you might be using Mesos or GCUS. So that's authored in that marathon is in JSON. Uh, you might you have to be modifying if the PaaS isn't doing it. You might have to be modifying your load balancing rules. You know, for Mod JK, that's in a particular uh, proprietary format. Um, wiring for the application servers, right? So you might be looking at, you know, what? How do I wire multiple wildfly instances together? That's something called XCaml. Uh, and then in the in-application clustering portion of, like, let's say, the in-memory grid stuff. Um, you know, that's all configured by XML from JGroups and Infinispan. But each one of these was a separate language. Each one of these had separate notation. Each one of these had separate ways to go about deploying. So how I, de how I deploy a JGroup change is it different than how I deploy a Wi-Fi change versus how, how I would deploy a load balancer change or a pass change or so on. And so each one of these was separate, right? Took expertise versus, you know what? If I, <laughs> you can wrap all of these into one very big Kubernetes manifest or multiple manifest, literally kubectl apply app, mega all as they have here. Uh, but that's basically it, right? Because of advancements in things like Helm, um, a package manager, or things like Customize, which is a configuration manager, uh, you're able to all speak the same language. We're all speaking YAML, right? Minus if you write like a, you know, an operator or a controller, that may be written in Go or another language, but you're all speaking the same language. There's nothing stopping you from writing one super lengthy <laughs> manifest or big YAML called mega all and just deploy it, right? Or apply it uh, and Kubernetes is up to the recent. Uh, because as now, Understanding those two particular things, right, um, is that, and also understanding uh, the, your Kubernetes cluster architecture, right? So as an engineer, uh, I'm always liking to take the path or developer taking the path of this resistance, right? So the great thing about Kubernetes is that, you know, the adage of don't let license costs determine your topology is actually very true. Kubernetes is, you know, technically free, right? It's an open source project. So from your local machine using like Minikube or K3, uh, you know, depending on how you architect your Kubernetes cluster, if you have one very large cluster, you know, you separate groups by namespaces, or if you have lots of multiple little clusters, uh, that's it. Clusters are cheap, right? But again, it, it all comes down to a management philosophy that you know, it, it's kind of diagnosed the patient for a certain type of workload. Uh, one of the things that you get out of the box with Kubernetes and where it gets a little bit uh, you know, tricky, it gets, it's actually very easy at the beginning, and it gets a little bit more tricky at, you know, as your workload start to age is that Kubernetes has this out-of-the-box functionality called a rolling upgrade or rolling update. Um, there's two strategies. There's a replace that will kill everything and then just restart everything. But rolling would be, uh, in this particular case, that it's exactly as a rolling update into previous application use. It's the same in Kubernetes. Uh, there's a number of running, let's say, instances. Uh, you define how many you need at any given time, how many you can go over, and Kubernetes will say, okay, you know what? Ravi said he wanted to... Uh, particular tacos, uh, and then you can use two all chunky otters here to go over. And so the first pass would be, okay, um, replace two and two, and then you can go to two total. It would have made more sense with four and four and two, right? But I was running out of space on the screen here. But you get the gist of it, right? It's like making sure that something starts, it's healthy, keep going, keep going, keep going until it's fulfilled. Uh, which, but, you know, it works kind of, you know, but if you start having... Uh, let's say workloads a substance, right? And having a rolling update, you know what? It can be either slow or it could be actually not as safe. It could be. The whole p part about continuous delivery is that you're supporting safety and iteration, right? So be going from uh, software is an iterative sport, right? You have to be able to prototype and then get, you know, make incremental changes uh, to release. And then if you need to go back, you need to be able to fail fast, right? And so uh, there's this deployment paradigm uh, called a canary release, right? So how do you support uh, not only incremental releases, lots of them, and also how can you support getting feedback quickly if something wasn't working? Uh, a little bit different than a rolling update or upgrade. Now, uh, using a, a canary or orchestrating canary will under underneath the covers be facilitating um, those particular mechanisms that are out of the box to Kubernetes. But if you're unfamiliar with what a canary release is, this is something we do all the time, uh, is that you actually, it's incremental release. So it basically, you're releasing a small portion. So here we have uh, a 33% a, a split here. So the Canary, let's say Chunky Otters version 1.1 or Chunky Otters version one of the application, the Canary version 1.1. Um, you would actually deploy version 1.1 and one at the same time. So two versions are running. Um, you would segregate traffic, you know, kind of split them by the load balancer level and say, okay, you know what? I'll, our, our instance is stable for 1.1, let's move on. And so you would promote the canary to stable. So Chunky Otter will be replaced here and the canary will now be ver version 1.1 is not stable and that's it, right? So as you make that judgment call uh, and validate, you know, you say, okay, ship the traffic over to 100%. And that's it, right? Like that's basically a very safe way of releasing. 
Um, all of this can be orchestrated into a pipeline. Uh, and so if you're unfamiliar with what a continuous delivery pipeline looks like, uh, this is typically what one looks like here. We're actually segregating uh, via different uh, job or different, let's say, functions. And so in this model, I'm actually a big fan of this model that it's, uh, it's I would like to call the tightening of the screw or tightening of the rope type of model, is that as you go from dev to QA to production, you're actually getting more strict in your rule sets, right? So development-centric tasks, you know, you might be doing things like unit tests or code coverage or static scans versus if you're going towards QA, you start introducing infrastructure. So you're using like perf tests or smoke tests. And then when you're getting into production uh, here, it's, you know, you're actually looking at how do we have a safe a safe release, like some sort of canary, uh, even continuing to run a uh, test after deployment. The going joke is, you know, when is your deployment over? Well, it's over when the next one goes in, right? Uh, and so it's just making sure that you uh, are staying, you're staying on it and have, making sure your external customers have a positive experience. Uh, lastly, I'll leave you with this um, as you're coming up the time here is that you know, only you know the level of automation that you like, right? So it's, you know, some of these topics might have been, a little, might be too much automation uh, for your particular group, but that's okay. Hey, you know what, you know it the best or depending where you are on your journey, uh, any sort of improvement is an improvement, right? You're helping better the craft. Uh, but with that, you know, thank you so much for catching my talk. I'm Robbie Lockman. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at Robbie Lock. And until next time, cheers, everybody.